Welcome back to the Transforming Basketball podcast. Delighted to be joined today by Yuji Suzuki. Yuji and I uh, had some uh, really enjoyable days hanging out in Portland during the tail end of my season last year. And uh, we we really just started diving into the future of how we think a return to play process could look like in the NBA. But obviously, these ideas uh, through an ecological approach and obviously these ideas apply to every level of basketball. And we just really enjoyed engaging in some very deep uh, and authentic conversations. And I knew I had to get UG on the podcast. So, so good to have you with us, man. Yeah, it's great to be here. It's always fun chatting with you. So I'm excited for this one, too. Absolutely. It's uh, it feels different not doing it over a, uh, a salt and straw weird ice cream flavor. But uh, we'll go for the Zoom. So, I mean, obviously, I was I was lucky, Yuji, because I'd followed your work for a long time. And it was just so fortunate that, obviously, you happen to be based in Portland. And and we basically, every off day I had in that second half of the season, we were hanging out um, and just talking about how we believed ecological ideas have so much potential in the return to play process. So could you just introduce for the coaches or practitioners in other roles listening to this, just introduce your background and kind of what you actually do. Yeah, so I am based in Portland, Oregon, uh, or just outside of it. Um, I am licensed as a chiropractor in the state of Oregon, um, but I also have my uh, CSCS certification, which is uh, more for strength and conditioning. Um, and I've been kind of immersed in the ecological approach for the past four or five years, kind of cont- um just thinking about how it can be applied to my kind of specific niche of working with people in pain or people um, who are having obstacles or limitations in terms of movement. And, you know, you have been a a big influence on how I kind of think about some of these ideas. And we've talked about this before where I learned so much from coaches who are applying it in, in various settings uh, whether that's basketball or baseball or um, fencing, uh, soccer, you know, some of these things, because we get to kind of think about what are the principles that transcend these sports and kind of speak the same language almost. And um, I get to kind of think about it in terms of rehab and return to sport and performance um, in my uh, can just kind of combining with what I've been learning through school and stuff. Great stuff, Yuji. So let's take a look at this return to play process. Simply a basketball player gets injured and it could be something relatively minor from an ankle sprain to something more serious, you know, the most severe typically in our sport, things like ACLs, Achilles. Could we quickly just outline the the dominant approach in this return to play process and what we typically would see? And this is not obviously basketball specific, but a lot of sports. Yeah, I think it, the linear progression uh, within the rehab process is certainly the dominant approach of, you know, it's this organism-centered approach where we're looking at the injured joint, injured muscle, kind of really zooming into that um, reductive one part of the organism um, and forget to kind of take a look at the, the whole person to begin with. And even expanding outside of that to the environment that they are currently having to interact with, as well as the environments that they have to go back to, right? So a lot of dominant approach looks like just tissue capacity focused, right? We're trying to get the range of motion back, get the strength back, get the force production ability back, this cutting change of direction technique back. um, And that can sometimes leave a gap in our opinion, through the ecological perspective, in terms of getting back into a more open environment, a live environment of the the sport, or even outside of the context of basketball, it it applies to people just going back to the day-to-day living um, life as well. So what I often see, UG, is even like, I'd say mine, uh, you know, obviously it depends on the type of ankle sprain, but I'm using this as an example. We often see things like ice being used immediately and um, trying to prevent swelling through compression. 
And, you know, I, I guess through the ecological approach, which is going to be the main basis of the rest of the podcast, where we share the alternative, would you say this starts with attempting to restore the system degrees of freedom as, as early as possible, obviously in a safe way? Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think ice and compression is necessarily a terrible thing, especially when considering timeline, right? Like I don't, it, it's specific to the context of like, if somebody is needing to really get back to play, there might be different options or choices being made by physical therapists, athletic trainers in order to get them back to, you know, at least being able to go back to the field or the the, the court. Um, but certainly I think there is ways to approach it from a kind of a constraints led approach where we can set boundaries in terms of, Hey, what are the, the lim what are the places we don't want them to go and what can we do with without crossing those boundaries right so even in the situations where you know somebody twisted their ankle they're in high amounts of um pain slash swelling we know that those are potential opportunities to have them interact with the task still whether they're sitting on a chair or um, they're just standing in place, going through passing activities as a, you know, a, a, a pillar slash obstacle, or again, as a passer, just participating, participating in these activities as much as possible, keeping them kind of attuned and sensitive to these uh, um, representative activities if that makes sense. It makes complete sense because what, what I'd say we often see even at the highest level, UG, is I would say a huge gap with nothing in the middle where an athlete might do something very linear in terms of doing lane slides, coming back from an injury, like doing jogging laps, shooting a jump shot, passing on one leg, you know, and it's, they might do that and then boom, they go straight into live play and there's often no you know, bridge through using the CLA, constraint small sided games, constraint activities. And I think what really stood out speaking with you is just how creative you can get designing some CLA activities, even very early on in the return to play process. And I think the best example here was your, your foam roller game, which I thought was so genius. Could you just explain that for the benefit of the listeners, balancing the foam roll to ensure, you know, they didn't go too fast? Right. Um, so I think this is getting into kind of manipulating the the complexity of the of the activity and the load and forces involved in the activity relatively independently. Right. So with after an injury, obviously there's going to be threshold that we don't want to cross in terms of maximum force that's involved to that joint area because we want to ensure they're safe and we're not furthering the injury but that doesn't mean necessarily mean that we have to completely eliminate perceptual information involved so this is an example uh that you know i had thought about is like it essentially create a box um of a, a zone of activity area using a cone or whatever this is just defining the space um and it could be as simple as uh, like a linear walking back and forth, jogging back and forth situation with another participant kind of uh, either going parallel to you or going across in front of you. Now, you know, you're kind of going through these jogging activities, but while having to stay attuned to another person also navigating that space. Now, the reason for a foam roller constraint uh, essentially holding a home foam roller kind of vertically on top of a, uh, of your hand. Now it's a balancing task that's added to the activity. So that is going to constrain speed um, a little bit and complexity of change of direction because they can't just start sprinting off and surpass that threshold of forces involved because they, they, if they start running, they're going to drop the foam roller. So this is one way to set a boundary around those kind of a, a, a load threshold that we don't want them to cross 
while maintaining perception action coupling as they have to start navigating spaces right which we know is very very important in in sports especially in basketball where you're just weaving around other moving humans that's fantastic usually so i i think we've spoken a lot and i wrote about this in the book about the silent approach which we see a lot you know in, in professional sport and i guess what we're getting at here is for return to play you can do the same cla activities that an ecologically orientated basketball coach could be doing just by having that shared conversation where maybe a PT, you know, an individual like yourself, uh, a basketball coach, a strength coach, they're all planning these activities based on all these different factors. And really we're just scaling constraints to ensure that, you know, whatever we're coming up with, like the example you just, you just gave is at the right stage of the return to play process. Yeah, hundred percent. I think that being able to speak the same language between coaches and and rehab professionals and uh, other personnel surrounding that team in support of you know the, the the athletes basically i think that's huge because we're not sending different messages between different professionals now we're speaking the same language we're we're speaking the same um intent for the athletes of like all right we're going to help you become a a better problem solver in the context of basketball or whatever else that might be. And we get to all use our expertise knowledge to achieve that uh, or in support of those goals of the athletes. Right. Yeah, that's so true. And just on this note, Uji, I think we, we, we talk a lot in basketball coaching about how there's no copy paste. There's no one size fits all. And, you know, we shouldn't just be using the same drills over and over again. How would that apply in your field in terms of, you know, really looking at more in a more individualized manner as opposed to, I guess, the dominant approach where PTs use kind of corrective exercises in the return to play? Yeah, um, it is. It takes this moving away from prescriptive approach of, hey, we don't actually know what is the best way to move. Uh, the next best thing we can do is to provide them with a, or uh, give them movement problems that is representative of the task that they have to get back to scale it so that it's not too complex that they're failing all the time or, or it's not too much over their capabilities. Right. And being able to, uh, again, encourage and facilitate their own, learning process of figuring out how they can, you know, engage with this environment to solve that task. Yeah. And that, that kind of leads on to, I guess, the practical task, which we've spent a lot of time recently doing. We, we've basically taken a first stab at designing a, an MBA return to play, not pro, I don't want to call it process, but concepts framework based completely on an ecological rationale. And it was really cool because we, I have obviously this activities library from my time in Italy and, you know, grateful for the time you spent, Eugene, you went through the videos, um, looking at, looking at how those could be used and how the constraints could be changed so that we could use those in a return to play. And you had some incredible notes there just things I, I would never have thought about. And I think that, would you say, Eugene, that's the first step in you know, if an organization is shifting towards an ecological approach, that's a good practical step to maybe get staff aligned and maybe begin shaping what the alternative could look like. Yeah. And just having these conversations is, I think, the most important part, right? Like I couldn't have come up with any of these activities myself, but because I had something to work off of in your vast library of examples of CLA activities and essentially how you approach um, just accomplishing things that you want to accomplish with these athletes. Now I get to think about, all right, how can I tweak this if in, or in the context of somebody who is returning um, to that activity, right? So instead of like, it's not like I can just give a athlete out of the thin air, just a magical exercise to give, but being able to have conversations with, 
with coaches of like, Hey, what do you think this athlete could use in order to kind of get back to what they need to be or what are they lacking and start to incorporate some of those with the understanding of biomechanics as well as just biomedicine. Right. So like figuring out, all right, here are the thresholds. Here is what we want to accomplish. How can we marry these things together to give the, the most ideal activity in this particular situation, which will then get updated over time after application, right? That's exactly it. And I, I think I, I, after, this, after this, I want to actually read some of the amazing ideas you had and just build on it now. But the one kind of thing I said to you when we, it was when we were getting brunch and I said to you, I had like an epiphany. I was like, well, could we just take a lot of these small sided games that I've done and really just change the speed intensity through scaling constraints? And then we've got a live, you know, movement problems in the return to play. And obviously would, it sounds very simplistic, but sure, just doing that, that provides a, a big competitive advantage, you know? Absolutely. I think these activities are great. And inherently, because of the constraints that you've utilized, there, there are, you know, some of the activities will involve less load for the athletes, whether it's need for cutting or, or speed or just complexity in general. And those become really good entry points or progressions um, when they do, when an athlete does have limitations in terms of, of physical capacities and tissue adaptations. That's it. So I wanted to look at those, Eugene. I'm, I want to maybe talk about some constraints which coaches listening will be familiar with, um, but I might touch on a few. And it would be great if you could talk about the context of how you are looking at some of these constraints and what they might be useful for in a return to play. So the first one we had was the blind series, which was the ball on the back of a defender facing the rim. Um, and this was something we spoke about because you said it was, you know, it's it's minimal steps, um, reducing complexity. Could you just talk about why that might, something like that activity, this blind one-on-one could be used for a return to play? Yeah, so blind must shoot. I think it was the must shoot constraint that, you know, really kind of sparked my curiosity because now they're not having to, or they're not, literally able to accelerate fast enough so the forces are going to be constrained it's going to be limited there's so much again force you can produce in that one step so that hey the, that that deceleration um need or deceleration demand is going to be lower for the offense and defense right um so that's kind of where my um mind went to when i was watching that activity in particular as well you know it, it's it's not as complex as a three on three or five on five or whatever else that might be it is constrained to one part of the game so you know there's less demand in terms of decision making albeit they still do have to make decisions in terms of how much you know space you give that offense or you know how quickly you're moving what's the strategy you're using to try to make that difficult for the offense or vice versa that's exactly it and it's i think what we're getting at here is it's it's the constraints just make this safe we're not ever going to say all right let's go play three on three immediately it's you know we're being way more you're being way more creative with how these constraints are, are being used so, so the next one I, I wanted to look at was the two basketballs um and I believe this was when the defender was actually dribbling or holding a basketball as well in a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, can you speak about what that kind of afforded just from a practical perspective, UG? Yep. So obviously this isn't um, perfectly representative of like an actual game situation, but because of that added constraint for the defender to have to dribble the ball as well, um, it is going to kind of slow down that activity a little bit, right? The defense can cannot be as aggressive because they have this other task that they have to interact with. So again, this would potentially present a another opportunity to return an athlete uh, as an as an offensive um, 
participant, or it could be defense as well. But again, it is going to constrain the intensity of the interaction between offense and defense by just adding that dribbling task for the defense. Fantastic. It, and and one which I really loved, Yuji, was we were speaking about cutting. And obviously that's something we see a lot in basketball. Um, whether it's a backdoor cut, a ghost cut, even a slip on a pick and roll. And that can be quite a, a tough movement in return to play. And then you said how a lot of athletes say they don't feel right about cutting. Could you just talk about some of the really creative solutions you had in in this specific scenario? Yeah, I think cutting is one of the most difficult things because the, the way we've been approaching it is trying to break it down. And what are the forces involved? What are the shin angles? What are the speeds and, and stuff like that? And I think those things are still very, very important. We should measure force production. And if we are seeing glaring deficits, you know, physical therapy and, and rehab process should address those things. Right. So I'm not advocating for ignoring those things, but at the same time, a more maybe ecological friendly approach to uh, practicing or returning to change of direction or agility is to utilize potentially different surfaces. Um, now it's easy to say, all right, specificity, they have to do it on court, but obviously that doesn't give the athlete as many or as wide of a range of the movement problem. So what we can do is potentially have them perform these activities in, in a kind of a gym type of floor, um, hardwood floor of basketball court versus turf versus carpet. And they could even kind of try to, we could even uh, introduce variability in terms of shoes that they're, wear, they're wearing, right? So one day they could be wearing gamers, but another day they could, be wearing, uh, you know, athletic street shoes or tennis shoes or whatever. Now they are having to, again, become more adaptable in terms of um, the, the constraints of the situation. Um, so they're not just practicing one movement solution per se. Now they're kind of just having to figure out, okay, in under this set of constraints, uh, how can I figure out how to just effectively change direction. Um, so that's kind of where my head went to um, when we were kind of just talking about that. This is great. Usually I, I think it's so, I, I really enjoy this because I know we're going quickly, but just having these practical examples, I think are so valuable as opposed to us just rattling through the theory, because this is, this is what, I mean, even if a coach has, a player on that high school team who has an ankle sprain, just trying some of these things are going to be so much more advantageous than, you know, the dominant approach, maybe putting them in an ankle strap and just doing very prescriptive, corrective exercise and boom, five on five, there you go. Um, which is probably more dangerous when you think about it. And what I loved you too, is how you actually started designing new activities completely based on, you know, just your creativity and the ideas you were seeing. And I think, that's a key part of it because then I, I talk about that too in terms of design your activities based on rate limiters, things you're seeing, don't just copy paste. Um, and, and I think, yes, of course, you have similar injuries that will be occurring. But I think, would you say there's so much scope through this framework for you to design completely new activities? And I think that's just so much more interesting for the athletes where they know maybe every day coming in, if they're injured, they're actually going to do something different with you as opposed to having this routine of the exact same exercises in and out, maybe they might actually look forward to doing the, this stuff. Yes, absolutely. I think being able to just be adaptable as a, as a coach or, or therapist, I think is, is, uh, you know, an important component to uh, providing the best type of support for the athletes and I think you're right. Uh, a very like variability in terms of activities that they're performing, right? Like we don't want them to ever be complacent in terms of just getting good at this one exercise. That's kind of what we are trying to combat with this ecological approach is that we, things we know about transfer, we can't just have them practicing one particular movement 
and and expect them to thrive in a more open environment where they have to just couple their movement to changing constraints and the information that they're picking up. Um, and just to kind of touch on this part as well, it's a constant process of updating these activities, right? So I got, I, you know, I came up with these ideas after watching your videos and we could try these out, but it sometimes some of them are not going to work at all, right? Like they're going to just kind of um, result in movement behaviors that are completely unexpected with a certain athlete and we have to just scrap it or we have to change it up. I think it's this kind of humbling understanding of like, uh, okay, this is a good idea, hopefully at least, but it has to get better with practice and in and, and process of just updating it. That's completely it. And I, I think on that note, Yuji, the first thing I, I say to kind of eclipse this silent approach and have this more unified organizational framework is literally just having more time, having these conversations, which you've already mentioned, but then actually working together. So what we often see is maybe the, the staff involved heavily in that return to play, mostly the PT, maybe the strength coach, I'd say, in, in an NBA context, they kind of only really get involved with the on-court when there's the problem. And then it's done. And then as soon as the athlete's good, maybe another week, boom, and then they're kind of removed from the equation. But how I look at it is continuous where you know, someone like yourself, or you'd be in all the on-court player development, you know, regardless of whether the player is injured or not, seeing, you know, how we manipulate constraints. Maybe you you'll e you'd even have amazing ideas to manipulate constraints, even though you're not a basketball coach, just with your knowledge of, of the theory. And then I think when an injury does happen, you're way better um suited to jump in through this framework, design really good activities, know where the athlete is at. And then critically, when the when the return to play is finished, you're not just done. I think you're continuously there in the several weeks and months after the injury, watching, continue to be involved in the process. What what do you think about that? We've kind of touched on or in our previous conversations how system can be a constraint to applying some of these approaches because again the constraints for the physical therapists or chiropractor or rehab professional is real in that team setting right like if they're overwhelmed with a bunch of athletes who are requiring you know uh, work up right they might not have time to be able to attend those practices and i think that's where um a top down understanding for the benefit of this unsiloed approach, this integrated approach is huge because it, it starts there. If the if a if a coach or a therapist is overwhelmed with just one part of their job, how can they go and just watch practice? Or how can they go to the therapy room and and ask for updates or you know share ideas? Um, and I think that's one of the frustrations that you shared with me was like there's no room for integrating these approaches because where you're fighting against the system sometimes yeah that's it and i think it's it's redefining that system and changing the constraints of an organization where the lines are more blurred and you're having this team of yes you're always going to have specialists but more of these generalists who can dip in and out and that's kind of what's promoted internally i think that's the only way you can really achieve this yeah. And, you know, I'm kind of talking about these problems or, and we are kind of talking about these problems, but I'm somebody who like, I know that there are hundreds and thousands of therapists who are very well equipped to treat ACL, treat ankle sprain, you know, much more than I am. But I think I'm the, where I'm maybe different is that I have this understanding that I've kind of built up of, of, the ecological perspective and I can kind of make suggestions in terms of, Hey, like this minor change that is not going to take away from your current intentions, but it might be able to align it a little bit better to this uh, updated contemporary motor learning and skill acquisition approach. Right. So I don't think it takes a whole lot in terms of like, we're not trying to change the whole process here but we can tweak 
the things within that approach and align it better to the mode of learning and skill acquisition, you know, literature, basically. That's it. I, I think, you know, a lot of teams kind of have KPIs, UG, to assess the performance of a medical team of player health. And I think one thing is we can't just assume that it's the player health staff who are responsible for everything because it's not, it's everyone. And again, this is the style of approach. It, you know, if the coaches are not periodizing practices and running high stress practices the whole time, then you can't blame, you know, someone in, in player health when it's really something stemming from a coaching staff. And I, I think that's where it's, it's very difficult to have these very fixed KPIs to evaluate because it just starts becoming reductionist unless you have the, you know, really specific metrics, I believe. Have you thought at all about that? I don't think we've spoken about that. That's a very difficult conversation because we, you know, at that level with that amount of financial investment, it's like we need to keep track of something and eliminate risk as much as possible, right? Um, but at the same time, we know that uh, human health performance winning, right? Those are all part of dynamical systems, right? It's not like we can take one part of it to improve the whole thing, right? And when we try to focus too much and, and chase efficiency in one part or one metric, that doesn't necessarily lead to the improvement of the entire system. Um, so I think, you know, not just the ecological side of things, but this dynamical systems understanding within an organization is needed, albeit quite difficult to implement in reality, I'm sure. Yeah, I guess, I guess it's, you know, acknowledging that it's a complex, the team is a complex system. It's, it's going to be unpredictable and it's several different, you know, there could be several different underlying factors leading to one thing. And I think that's an interesting one that I think we'll do some more thinking on just in terms of how you could actually quantify that this stuff is having a, the difference that I believe it really could have. Um, so you, you know, really grateful for you taking the time. I think um, the first of uh, many appearances on the podcast and your involvement with, with transforming basketball, but uh, where can coaches, practitioners listening to this, find out more about you? Yeah, I'm most active on uh, Instagram and X. Um, on Instagram, uh, I think my handle is huge gains. So Y U J G A I N S. Um, and on X, it's Yuji Suzuki DC. Um, and again, I'm applying these things with the mindset that these need to be improved, right? Um, so any, I, enjoy these discussions uh, with people like you and, and people who are listening, please feel free to kind of reach out and kind of share your thoughts, ideas. Um, and maybe we can kind of bring not just basketball, but sports and, and movement practices forward um, together. I think that's kind of where I would like to see things going. Absolutely agree. Yuji, thank you so much. Um, appreciate, appreciate it and uh, look forward to talking soon. Yeah, thanks, Alex. This was fun.